everyone. We're going to start on this chapter on atomic spectroscopy, and we'll talk about two methods based on absorbance. That's the flame atomic absorption spectrometer, or flame AA, and we'll talk a little bit about furnace AA, and then one emission method, which is the induct inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometer, or ICP-OES. Let's begin with a general overview. So if we can recall a simple single beam instrument that you saw when looking at spectrophotometers, there was a light source, a wavelength selector that allowed you to pick monochromatic radiation that interacted with your sample, probably in a cuvette, and then a transducer. In a flame, the components are very similar. The light source, however, is a hollow cathode lamp. The sample is not found in a cuvette, it's found in a flame, but you still have a wavelength selector and a detector. The furnace AA is also very similar. It also uses a hollow cathode lamp. The, the sample is found inside of this small furnace. It's only about an inch long. And absorbance is measured. You still have these components. And then finally, in ICP, there is a plasma. Notice that something's missing here. We don't have a light source because the plasma is a little bit different, but you still have the wavelength selector and a detector. So you probably realize that the flame is hot. The furnace in most cases is even hotter and the plasma is the hottest. So what is the function of all of this heat in the flame, furnace, and ICP. The flame, furnace, and plasma, I'll just say, in an ICP, they are all atomizers. And before we talk about atomization, I think I'll interrupt the video and show you in person what the flame, furnace, and plasma atomizers look like. Hi there. I just wanted to show you the atomizers up close. This is the flame atomizer. Really, this is the burner head from the flame. So the flame is produced here, and we have our gaseous atoms here, and then radiation from the hollow cathode lamp shines through the flame and our gaseous atoms absorb that radiation. So this is the flame atomizer. This is the furnace atomizer and maybe you'll have to take my word for it but at the very top there is a small hole and I'm just going to use a pencil to maybe point that out to you. There's a small hole here, and that's where you would introduce the sample, either using an auto sampler or with a micro pipette. And this furnace is made of graphite. So in a furnace AA, a current is applied across this graphite tube. And since graphite is not a good conductor of electricity, it gets hot, and that little drop of sample that you've added gets atomized. When that happens, again, radiation from the hollow cathode lamp shines through and your gaseous atoms absorb that radiation. So this is the furnace. And then finally, this is the torch from our ICP. If you look closely, maybe you can see that this one was on the verge of melting. You can kind of see that little divot there. Torches in ICP can be oriented with a so-called radial geometry. Ours is not like that. Ours had an axial geometry. Um, so those were the atomizers. We'll get back to the video now.
I hope you enjoyed seeing those atomizers in person. Before we talk a little bit more about atomization, let me make one important distinct distinction that I think is probably obvious to you. In flame and furnace AA, remember AA stands for atomic absorption, so we're measuring absorption. And in ICP, we're measuring emission of radiation. So remember, there was no light source here because the plasma is so hot, not only does it function as an atomizer to atomize our sample, it's hot enough to promote our analyte to an excited electronic state, which I'll just, I'll call our analyte X, and I'll use an asterisk to represent that it's electronically excited as it relaxes back down to the ground state, back to X in the ground state, it releases a photon, and that is what is measured. That is the emission of radiation that you're measuring, so there is no source. The sample itself, if you will, is the source. But let's talk more about the process of atomization. Again, the flame, furnace, and plasma are all atomizers. And if I would have to define atomization, I would call it the production of gaseous atoms from, and I'm going to say an aqueous sample because that's what you worked with in lab. But it could also be from a solid sample if you have a laser that's functioning as your atomizer. But I think for us, atomization can be nicely defined as the production of gaseous atoms from an aqueous sample. So let's think about that a little bit. Imagine we had some aqueous iron it's in some solution, and imagine you're running the flame AA, so your sample goes through a nebulizer, and we'll talk about the nebulizer in a little bit more detail, and you have still your iron in the aqueous form, but now there's kind of a wet mist, and then it enters the atomizer, and in the presence of all of that heat, you hope to produce gaseous iron atoms. Now the heat from the heat from an air acetylene flame is hot enough to create this these gaseous iron atoms. But what if we had aluminum? in our sample and we wanted to run aluminum using this air acetylene flame it would go through the nebulizer to create our mist and we would have still aqueous aluminum in our mist and then it would enter the flame atomizer and it would encounter some heat but the heat produced from an air acetylene flame is not hot enough to create gaseous aluminum atoms. So if we're limited to using an air acetylene flame for aluminum, nothing happens, no reaction. In order to atomize aluminum, we're going to have to use a hotter flame. So if I can redraw this and this, what type of flame might work? Well, it would probably have to use a different oxidant. Nitrous oxide may be hot enough. So nitrous oxide and acetylene, that type of a flame will produce these gaseous aluminum atoms, which is what you want. This flame is hot enough. Or if you're lucky like we are and you have an ICP, The heat from the plasma 
is hot enough to produce those gaseous aluminum atoms. So yes, we'll create gaseous aluminum, aluminum atoms. Let's go back to this iron example and think about some matrix effects that we could observe. What if in our sample there was a lot of sulfate? So what if we had this iron sulfate complex that was soluble in our sample and it goes through the nebulizer and a mist is created so you still have that iron sulfate complex it's still aqueous it's, it's in that mist form and now it enters the flame where it encounters some heat but if you're using an air acetylene flame, so if we have this air acetylene flame, it is not hot enough to produce those gaseous iron atoms that we wanted. So what can we do in this instance? If you're limited to this air acetylene flame and you don't have an ICP and you don't have the ability to use this nitrous oxide acetylene flame, which is hotter, you may have to add a matrix modifier. You can add substances that can release iron from sulfate such that you can create these gaseous atoms. But the alternatives to using the matrix modifier would be to use a hotter flame or even better to use a plasma. I think on the next slide, I'll show you this process, but I'm gonna use a figure that I found in a textbook. Yes, here it is. But it's basically the same thing I showed you on the previous slide. You have your aqueous sample that gets nebulized. You have that wet mist. And then this, as you know, means heat. So at this point, we are in the atomizer. Whether it's the flame, the furnace, or the ICP. And the first thing that heat does is to produce a dry aerosol. And then you want to volatilize gaseous atoms from that dry aerosol. This is always what we want in atomic spectroscopy. Sometimes we get ions and sometimes we get gaseous molecules. These are so-called chemical interferences. And we'll talk about how to deal with that. So I think that's all for right now. In our next video, we'll talk about the Flame AA in more detail. Thanks for listening.